Look, I've been studying prehistoric human interactions for years now, and honestly, when I first came across Danny Vendramini's theory about Neanderthal predation, I had to pause and really think about what I was reading. This wasn't just another academic paper. This was someone proposing that our closest evolutionary relatives were basically nightmarish monsters hunting us for food. The whole premise sounds like something straight out of a horror movie, doesn't it? Furry, super strong humanoids with night vision, stalking early humans through the darkness of Ice Age Europe. And here's the thing that really gets me. Vendramini isn't just some random person making wild claims. He's a filmmaker and author who wrote an entire book called Them and Us about this theory. But when you dig into the actual evidence, well, that's where things start falling apart pretty quickly. Let me walk you through what Vendramini is actually claiming here. According to his hypothesis, mainstream science has got Neanderthals completely wrong. Instead of the intelligent, tool-making humans that paleontologists describe, he paints them as ape-like predators covered in thick fur with massive strength and eyes adapted for night hunting. The story goes like this. These creatures would stalk early Homo sapiens under cover of darkness, using their superior night vision to ambush our ancestors when they were most vulnerable. They'd drag victims away, butcher them, and feast on human flesh. The pressure from this constant predation supposedly drove human evolution, forcing our species to develop language, advanced tools, and complex social behaviors just to survive. And I'll admit, there's something compelling about this narrative. It plays into our deepest fears about being hunted by something stronger and more dangerous than ourselves. The idea that we evolved our intelligence specifically to outwit these predators has a certain dramatic appeal. But here's where we need to separate storytelling from science. First off, let's talk about what Vendramini gets wrong about basic scientific terminology. He calls his ideas a theory, but that's not how science works. In scientific terms, a theory is something like evolution or gravity, a well-supported explanation backed by mountains of evidence. What Vendramini has is a hypothesis at best, and honestly, not a very well-supported one. Now, about those reconstructions of Neanderthals looking like chimpanzees. This is where things get really problematic. Vendramini argues that since Neanderthals lived in Ice Age Europe, they must have evolved thick fur to survive the cold. He claims they had a hunched, forward-leaning posture like modern apes. But here's the crucial anatomical fact that completely destroys this argument. The foramen magnum. That's the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord connects. In humans and Neanderthals, this hole is positioned toward the front of the skull base, directly underneath the brain. In chimpanzees and other quadrupedal apes, it's positioned toward the back. This isn't some minor detail. It's fundamental evidence of how these creatures held their heads and moved through the world. The foramen magnum placement in Neanderthals proves they were fully upright, bipedal beings, just like us. If they had the hunched posture Vendramini describes, their necks would have to bend at impossible angles just to look forward. Recent research has actually confirmed this connection between foramen magnum position and upright walking across multiple mammalian species. Scientists at Stanford studied bipedal animals like kangaroos and found that this forward placement of the spinal cord opening is directly linked to upright posture. And about that fur theory... Genetic evidence shows that humans lost their body hair around two million years ago, long before the split between our lineage and Neanderthals. Archaeological evidence backs this up too. We found clear proof that Neanderthals spent enormous amounts of time processing animal hides, making clothing and shelter. Why would they need to do this if they were already covered in thick fur? The night vision claim is interesting because it's actually the one piece of Vendramini's hypothesis that has some basis in reality. Neanderthals did have larger eyes and a bigger visual cortex than modern humans. But larger eyes don't equal supernatural night vision. They just mean better performance in low-light conditions, like dawn and dusk hunting. Modern humans from Arctic regions also tend to have larger eyes than people from equatorial regions, and nobody claims they can see in the dark. What really bothers me about this whole predation theory 
is how it ignores the mountain of evidence we have about Neanderthal behavior and intelligence. These weren't mindless killing machines. They created sophisticated tools, made art, cared for their sick and elderly, and possibly even buried their dead with grave goods. More importantly, we have direct genetic evidence that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred. Recent studies show that most non-African people today carry between 1 and 4 percent Neanderthal DNA. This interbreeding happened multiple times over tens of thousands of years, most intensively around 47,000 years ago. Think about what this means. If Neanderthals were really the terrifying predators Vendramini describes, constantly hunting and eating humans, would we have evidence of peaceful interbreeding? Would human women have willingly mated with these creatures? The genetic evidence tells a very different story. One of two closely related human populations that met, interacted, and sometimes formed families together. The DNA evidence also reveals something fascinating about Neanderthal genes in modern humans. Many of these inherited genetic variants appear to have provided survival advantages, particularly for immune system function and adaptation to different climates. Some Neanderthal genes helped our ancestors fight off viral infections they encountered when leaving Africa. Others influenced skin pigmentation and metabolism in ways that helped humans adapt to new environments. This doesn't sound like the legacy of a predator-prey relationship. It sounds like the result of two intelligent human populations sharing beneficial genetic adaptations. Now, let's address the population numbers. Vendramini claims that Neanderthal predation reduced human populations to as few as 50 individuals in Western Asia. But genetic evidence shows that any population bottleneck during this period occurred within Africa, not among the populations that had migrated out. Archaeological evidence also contradicts the predation theory. There were probably never more than 10,000 Neanderthals across all of Europe and Asia at any given time. That's an incredibly small population spread across a vast geographic area. The typical group size for both species was around 20 individuals, with only half being adults. The idea of pitched battles between these tiny scattered groups is just not realistic. More likely, most groups would have avoided each other entirely, with occasional peaceful encounters leading to trade, information exchange, and sometimes interbreeding. What's particularly frustrating is how Vendramini's hypothesis relies on outdated stereotypes about hunter-gatherer societies being simple and violent. Ethnographic studies of modern hunter-gatherer populations show incredibly sophisticated social structures, complex cultural traditions, and detailed systems of ethics and taboos. There's no reason to assume that Paleolithic humans and Neanderthals were any different. These were intelligent people with rich cultural lives, not savage brutes acting purely on instinct. The archaeological record does show evidence of violence during the Paleolithic period, but it's relatively rare and appears to involve conflicts within species rather than between them. When we do find trauma on Neanderthal bones, it's usually consistent with the dangers of hunting large animals at close range, not warfare with humans. What really concerns me about theories like this is how they can spread despite being contradicted by virtually every piece of scientific evidence. Vendramini's book was published over a decade ago, and his ideas have been thoroughly debunked by experts in paleoanthropology, genetics, and human evolution. Yet I still see people in comments sections arguing that his ideas are more realistic than mainstream science. There's something seductive about these alternative theories, that promise hidden knowledge that experts don't want you to know. But science isn't about what makes the most dramatic story. It's about following the evidence wherever it leads, even when that evidence paints a less sensational picture than we might prefer. The real story of human Neanderthal interactions is actually far more interesting than Vendramini's predation fantasy. We're learning about complex relationships between different human populations, sophisticated cultural exchanges, and the genetic legacies that still influence our biology today. Recent research has revealed that interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals wasn't just a one-time event. It happened repeatedly over hundreds of thousands of years. 
Some of these interactions go back much further than previously thought, with evidence of gene flow occurring as early as 250,000 years ago. This paints a picture of dynamic, ongoing relationships between human populations rather than the simple predator-prey dynamic that Vendramini proposes. The truth is, Neanderthals weren't our predators. They were our relatives. They shared our basic human nature with all the complexity that entails. They weren't demons lurking in the darkness, but intelligent, adaptive people trying to survive in a challenging world, just like our own ancestors. Understanding this relationship helps us better understand ourselves. The Neanderthal genes we carry today are reminders that human evolution wasn't a straight line from primitive to modern, but a complex web of interactions, adaptations, and shared heritage. Every time someone gets their DNA analyzed, and discovers they have Neanderthal ancestry, they're learning about this ancient family connection. It's a much more meaningful legacy than the horror story Vendramini tries to sell. So the next time you hear someone promoting the Neanderthal predation theory, remember that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And when you examine the actual evidence, from genetics, anatomy, archaeology, and anthropology, it all points in the same direction toward a story of human kinship rather than prehistoric terror. That's the real scientific consensus, built on decades of careful research by experts around the world. It might not make for the most dramatic headlines, but it's far more accurate than the sensationalized alternatives. Thanks for watching Violent Origins. If you enjoyed this deep dive into separating scientific fact from fiction, make sure to like this video and subscribe for more evidence-based explorations of human history. Leave a comment below if there are other controversial theories you'd like us to examine. We're always looking for new topics to investigate thoroughly and honestly.